There we go. All right. Well, we are delighted to be welcoming Duncan to the Sing Space, apart from having the best name ever. Uh, <laughs> Duncan is a singer, baritone, uh, opera singer, and has a master's in human nutrition and is on the multidisciplinary, disciplinary, that's, um, that word is not working so well on, on a hot <laughs> Monday evening, um, team at uh, Vocal um, at the uh, Voice Care Centre in Soho. And a lot of you know that um, very well because of Stephen. Stephen's been at Sing Space um a lot we've been in we've also been here as well um which has been great so duncan whenever you want to take over um take it away great hey thanks rachel um thank you all for coming on a uh, what turned out to be a, a beautiful monday night um uh, it's it's a pleasure to be here with you all today um Today, I, I thought I would talk, um, obviously, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a singer and a, and a nutritionist and, you know, the world of nutrition is a pretty big, expansive world that we can talk about. But since we're all singers here, we're all vocal professionals, I thought I would give um, very sp singer specific, I try to keep it quite narrow, singer specific nutrition is what we're going to focus on today. And of course, my slides won't work. Okay, great. Um, thank you, Rachel, for the, the kind introduction. Um, just so you know sort of what led me to giving this a little talk with you today. Um, uh, I began my career in the health sciences world at the Australian Institute of Fitness. I, I grew up in Western Australia and then my life took a bit of a turn and I studied um, a master's in music at the Guildhall School of Music and Drama here in London. I then on, went on to have my early opera career at places like the English National Opera and Glyndebourne. And then more recently, places like the Royal Opera House and uh, singing roles at places like the Metropolitan Opera in New York. My master's in nutritional science is from Deakin University in Melbourne. And I run my own bespoke nutrition consultation, Duncan Rock Nutrition. And I also work specifically with uh, singers and professional voice users at the Voice Care Centre in London. So that's sort of how my worlds uh, collided, both my singing and nutrition world. So the structure for today, I thought I'd focus on the most common issues I tend to face with clients at the Voice Care Centre. We work with a lot of musical theatre performers, pop stars, radio presenters and actors and so forth. So I thought this was likely the stuff that was going to be most applicable to you guys. Um, we're going to talk about optimal hydration, how much fluid and when. We're going to talk about the bane of my existence, reflux and gastroesophageal reflux disease. We're going to talk about a, a really important issue in my experience, nutrition for immune health, often overlooked and, uh, and poorly adhered to. And then we'll just finish with a little bit of myth busting or sort of diving into um, some common myths in the world of, of vocal health, vocal nutrition, things like, is dairy bad for your voice? Is coffee bad for your voice? Things of that nature. Um, I thought I'd try and give you about 45 to 50 minutes of content and leave a few minutes at the end for any questions, if, should you have any. And perhaps Rachel suggested, if you have any questions, pop them into the chat box and we'll, we'll look at them at the end, if there are any. Hydration. So. Why is hydration important for a singer? You're probably all aware there is a thin layer of mucosa that covers the vocal cords, um, which if it's of the correct viscosity or thickness, uh, it allows for optimal vibration of the cords with minimal effort, which is of course exactly what we want. If you are dehydrated, or and by, by dehydrated, I don't mean you know walking through the desert, dying of thirst, dehydrated. I'm talking about one to 2%, something you might not even notice physiologically. It might not even activate your, thirt, uh, your thirst reflex. That layer of mucosa on the vocal cords will become thicker and more viscous. And this will mean that in order to phonate, in order to make your vocal cords vibrate, you will need to force more air through them and force the vibration. And as you're all singers, so you probably recognize that is a suboptimal 
way of singing, of using your mechanism. It can lead to acute issues, you know, day-to-day -day issues. If you do this throughout a six, seven, eight hour rehearsal day or for an entirety, entirety of a two, three hour performance, this will of course mean you're likely more vocally tired by the end of the day. And of course, more chronic long-term issues. If you do this for a long enough period of time, it can lead to more serious issues, vocal polyps, lesions, uh, chronic, uh, chronic laryngitis, and so forth. So this, is, this area of hydration is quite easy to get right, but there are significant consequences if you don't. So worth, you know, worth knowing what to do. So how do you hydrate? Uh, there's obviously external hydration, which is really anything to do with steaming, going to a steam room, having a hot shower, sitting over a, a, a bowl of hot water with a towel draped over your head. I've done that many times in my singing career. This is the only way of getting hydration directly onto the vocal cords. Um, because as I'm sure you're probably aware, no food or drink that you consume actually directly touches the vocal cords. And the only way you hydrate internally, the other form of hydration, is through systemic hydration of the whole body through consumption of fluids and of course, um, fluid containing foods, which is, a, which is the type of hydration that is most relevant to a nutritionist. So external hydration, steaming, internal hydration, systemic whole body hydration through consumption of fluids. How much water should I drink as a singer? Of course, it's impossible to give an accurate, generalized answer to 12, 13 people, however many people I'm speaking to right now that I have never met before. Um, this is due to inter, between me and you, and intra, within me, or within you, variability. So how much fluid I need might be slightly different to how much fluid you need, and how much fluid you need today may be slightly different to how much fluid you needed yesterday due to things like body size, muscle mass, age, gender, how hot it is, how much movement uh, you, you achieve today, and so forth. The most accurate generalized advice I could give you is this equation. Consume one mil of water per calorie burned daily. So if you are, just to give you a general ballpark, for the average woman consuming about 2000 calories, that would equate to about two liters of water daily. And the average man consuming about two, two and a half thousand calories, that would equate to about 2.5 liters of water daily. Those are the sort of averages. Someone like myself, uh, larger than average, I'm about 6'3 and I'm, I'm very active. I probably need a bit more than that, three and a half to four liters. You might be the same. Um, but that's a, a useful equation that takes into account some of the factors that cause the interpersonal variability. I would add four performances and rehearsals, and that it would include maybe teaching time, to that two liters, for example, for the average woman, about 100 to 150 mils per hour rehearsed. So let's say you rehearse for three hours today in the morning, you might wanna add about 300 to 450 mils of water to that total. Um, and this is to account for the fluid lost with expiration. You're probably aware that talking and singing actually causes the, the loss of fluid. And of course, physical exertion. There's quite a lot of physical exertion associated with singing and rehearsing. So consume a little bit extra fluid to account for that. When to hydrate, and you might be aware that fluid timing is actually, in many cases, as important as the total quantity of fluid consumed. This is because the body can only be hydrated to a certain extent. In this way, it's different to our food mechanism, for example. So, you know, if I had a huge dinner last night, you know, three, four thousand calories. I can store that energy in my liver glycogen, my muscle glycogen, and in my body fat to use that energy at a later date. We have a very useful uh, store now, use later mechanism when it comes to calories from food. 
This doesn't uh, map onto hydration status. There's a, a maximum level of hydration that one can achieve over which you cannot go. So if I wake up this morning, for example, and drink five liters of water, I don't suddenly become in a sort of super hydrated state and I don't need to drink the next day and a half. I'll, if I do that, I'll simply spend the next couple of hours going to the bathroom uh, a lot. So the excess fluid will simply be excre excreted. Um, people often ask at this point, what about the common sense approach? Why don't I just drink when I'm thirsty? Fair question. The truth is when you feel thirst, you are already somewhat dehydrated and certainly dehydrated enough for the impact on the vocal cord mucosa to have already taken effect. So it's not a particularly useful gauge for a, a singer. And then secondly, your thirst will be satiated before complete hydration is achieved. So yeah, I mean, drinking when you're thirsty is great. It'll keep you alive. And it's probably absolutely fine for someone working at Lloyd's or you know, someone for whom the vocal mechanism isn't particularly important. But as singers and voice professionals, we are talking about optimization here. So uh, it's better to think of thirst as a warning system, not a gauge um, to which, uh, which you should uh, go by for optimization. So the first tip of the day, for optimal hydration, drink little and often. Um, so drink your 2.5 liters of water as uh, drawn out throughout the day as is practical. You don't have to take a sip every 10 minutes, but you know, don't drink it all at once. Don't drink it in three big goes. As uh, frequently throughout the, day, uh, uh, throughout the day as is possible. And a tip I would add on top of that is to start the day hydrated. So you wake up after six, seven, eight, nine hours sleep. Not me, I have a, a one-year-old baby, but uh, you know, under normal circumstances, uh, you might sleep for that long. Of course, you wake up in a slightly dehydrated state. Um, and if you don't catch up, uh, if you don't sort of, uh, sort of fix that first thing in the morning, you'll spend the rest of your day catching up on your hydration status, which is obviously suboptimal for a singer. So I would recommend you start every day with a big glass of water, like a pint, four to 600 mils of water. This will get you started on the right foot with your hydration status. Reflux, one of the most common issues I deal with at the Voice Care Center. Reflux tends to be very over self-diagnosed. A lot of people will default to thinking they have reflux uh, and it often can be to compensate for perhaps another issue that's lurking in the background. And unfortunately, reflux is massively subject to inter-individual variability. You will notice that is the theme for this topic. What exacerbates symptoms of reflux in me may alleviate symptoms of reflux in you. And that makes, the, the, um, that makes this topic quite difficult to talk about and quite difficult to give very concrete advice. However, there are two potential culprits that in the scientific literature and also in my anecdotal experience, I would turn to first for someone who is suffering from issues of reflux. And yes, I'm sorry, it is all the fun stuff. Sugar, reducing intake has been proven to yield significant benefit, particularly for chronic sufferers of reflux. So if you're someone who's been dealing with reflux type symptoms for a long time, three months, six months, a year, two years, reducing sugar is likely gonna be of some value to you, to you. Even if it doesn't fix the issue, it normally at least reduces the severity of symptoms. Now, when I'm talking about sugar, I'm not talking about an apple, I'm not talking about a banana, I'm talking here about extrinsic sugars, the stuff that is added to foods and of course, all the delicious things you're thinking about, yes, those things. Unfortunately, to be the bearer of, of bad news. But in truth, in a Western diet, most of us overconsume sugar anyway. So worth going down this avenue for a sufferer of reflux. Secondly, alcohol. 
in the research, unfortunately, the, uh, the results aren't quite as conclusive as with sugar. However, overall, the trend is a positive correlation between alcohol consumption and reflux symptoms. So if you are, once again, someone who suffers from reflux, reducing alcohol consumption might yield some significant benefit. You may have heard of many, many other potential culprits for sufferers of reflux. Um, in my experience, every singing teacher has, you know, knows the cure for reflux or has advice to give in this sphere. For example, fatty foods. Theoretically, this may yield benefit. Fatty foods delay gastric emptying. That means that food stays in your stomach for longer. Um, so theoretically, that means the longer the food is in the stomach, the more likely it is to reflux up the esophagus. Coffee is also often thrown around in this context um, and, and sort of on that similar vein, acidic drinks. Now acidic drinks can reduce the acidity of stomach contents. Theoretically, that means a more acidic reflux is more likely to cause damage to the esophagus. Theoretical concern. However, it's very important to note that in all these cases, consistent effect on symptoms has not been demonstrated in practice or in trials. So yes, you can try these things, but there's really uh, most of the purported efficacy is through anecdote, through word of mouth, old wives tales. And you're better off in first instance, trying something that is proven to have efficacy, reducing sugar, reducing alcohol, and eating behaviors. Um, there's a, a, quite a lot of evidence that eating regular, smaller meals can be very efficacious in this sphere. Um, obviously, the less food there is in the stomach, the less, like, the less likely it is to reflux up the esophagus. Sleeping on your left side, surprisingly, is extraordinarily effective. You, probably, you might be aware that the esophagus doesn't attach directly into the center of the stomach. It, attach, it attaches into the right side of the stomach. So as you lie on your left side, this is me trying to lie on my left side, uh, this, the esophagus attaches into the right of the stomach, which means gravity, puts the, the contents of my stomach to the left, making it less likely to reflux up the esophagus. Sounds crude, sounds strange, but it works. And third, in a similar vein, lying with your head elevated. This is my head and this is my feet. If I elevate my head slightly, simple gravity will make uh, stomach contents less likely to reflux up the esophagus. Some of these things do sound crude, but Sometimes our, our body is quite mechanical in nature and, and, and crude interventions can be very valuable. Immune health, I call this an essential element in the life of a performer. Your immune health or suffering from generally poor immune health can likely have significant obviously health consequences. You don't wanna feel ill all the time but very practical consequences, particularly for a singer. No one wants to cancel performances due to illness. In my world, the, 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 the opera world, if I'm singing a role at the Metropolitan Opera, if I don't go on, I don't get paid. Um, and there have been a couple of instances in my career where a cold has literally cost me tens of thousands of dollars in income because I wasn't able to perform, so I wasn't able to get paid. So obviously there's this incredible incentive to go on stage. I work with a lot of West End performers at the Voice Care Centre and a common thread I experience, particularly with younger performers, is the fear of being surpassed, replaced, taken over by their understudy. So they will often go on under suboptimal conditions because of this overriding in fear, this incentive to go on stage. And as I'm sure you're likely thinking this can have of course acute consequences but chronic consequences singing when you are unwell lead to significant 
vocal health issues in the not particularly long term. It doesn't need to go on for years to be significant. You know, we're talking months, weeks and months here. Your immune function is what we call a modifiable physiological characteristic, which means its effectiveness can increase and decrease through our behavior. If I went out last night and drank nine cocktails and danced all night and got to bed at 4 a.m. and woke up at 7 a.m., likely the effectiveness of my immune system will decrease. If I then spend all of today hydrating, resting, eating nutritious food, my immune functioning effectiveness will gradually come back up. So it's a, it's a modifiable physiological characteristics, uh, characteristic through behavior. However, some misleading common vernacular in this arena. It is impossible to supercharge your immune system, no matter what a supplement company might tell you to sell a product. Similar to the hydration status I was talking about earlier, you have a maximum level of effectiveness over which you cannot go. So. A smoothie won't supercharge or boost your immune system, nor will a multivitamin, nor will a pill of, of any kind. So before you try various potions and supplements that I know that singers are likely to be drawn to, I would consider these top five beneficial behaviors that are shown both in the, in the scientific literature and that I've noticed in my anecdotal experience working with now hundreds, maybe thousands of clients that are likely to be the most effective at improving your immune functioning. Eating sufficient fruits and vegetables, eating sufficient total calories, minimizing intake of processed foods, prioritizing sleep, and exercising, but not overdoing it. And we're going to go through each of these now in a bit more detail. Excuse me. So eating sufficient fruits and vegetables. Why? Micronutrients. Optimized immune functioning is impossible when you are deficient in certain micronutrients. And I will impress upon you that avoiding deficiency here is key. There is no substantive benefit to mega dosing in micronutrients. And I recognize this is a heavily ingrained idea. And I empathize this, with this. I've, I've been guilty of this myself, but I can't tell you how many times I've been at whatever, Glyndebourne, and you, you, know, you arrive at the theater for a performance and you hear, oh, the, you know, the soprano is feeling a bit under the weather today. She's not feeling that well. So you go to the dressing room to knock on the door to wish them good luck you know, for what may be a difficult performance. And you, they open the door and you see lined up on the uh, dressing room table, all the pills and potions that might help one get through a performance. You know, this is something I've experienced countless times. I understand it's heavily ingrained in the psyche of performance, but there is no substantive benefit that, for example, if your RDI, your recommended daily intake of vitamin C, if that is 2000 milligrams, there is no evidence of benefit to taking 5000 milligrams, for example. So, you know, those little effervescent orange capsules that you might buy from Boots, if they're over your recommended daily intake, you're simply giving yourself expensive urine. Um, you'll simply excrete anything over the necessary amount. So why is this a bad thing? You know, well, firstly, potential detriments. It's a waste of money. And I don't know about you, but I certainly don't have millions of, of pounds lying around that I want to waste. But more importantly, from a, a health perspective, it tends to make people focus on the wrong aspect. We, I, I often see a mentality where people will assume that the taking of a multivitamin or uh, some sort of placebo, or echinacea or whatever, will compensate for poor dietary and lifestyle habits. It's sort of a, it's used as a band-aid, but this tends to lead people down a unhelpful path. 
uh, to ill health. So it's a focusing on that wrong aspect. You know, instead of eating a nutritious diet, I'll just take this pill. We want that to be the case, but of course, the evidence tells us that there's no real value to doing this. So my advice in this sphere, consume five to 10 servings of fruits and vegetables every day, consistently. I know that might sound a lot, but uh, that's truly the amount that we need for optimal health and optimal immune health. And more variety tends to equal more benefit. It's a wonderful quirk of nature that the nutrient content of fruits and vegetables tend to map, tends to map on quite nicely to the colors of fruits and vegetables. So you should try, a lot of nutritionists will say, eat a rainbow, eat green, red, orange, purple, often neglected, red, uh, uh, yellow and so forth, white. More variety tends to equal more benefit. Eat sufficient calories, point two. Welcome news to most people. Who doesn't wanna be told they can eat um, lots of delicious, nutritious food? This will help you achieve the sufficient micronutrients needed for point one, fruits and vegetables, that's great. And also something which I do face a lot at the voice care center due to the cultural pressures, the body image pressures a lot of performers face at the moment. Rapid weight loss tends to be accompanied with an acute decrease in immune functioning. We know this fairly, um, conclusively. Um, so often I'll have a performer come to me who's just landed a, a phenomenal role in a, I don't know, a new Netflix film, for example, uh, and they want to lose whatever, two stone in six weeks. It can be done, but unlikely without an, ac an acute decrease in immune functioning. So for someone who has to sing, for someone for whom, uh, for whom immune functioning is extremely important, this is unadvisable. Um, you don't need to give up on your body composition or, or weight loss goals, but be cautious. Uh, a good rule of thumb is you don't want weight loss, should you want to achieve weight loss, of more than about 1% of total body weight per mm -hmm week. So I often use myself as an example because I weigh about 100 kilos. So the maths is very easy. Uh, I wouldn't want to lose more than about 500 grams to a kilo uh, per week. That would be the upper limit uh, if I want to achieve weight loss without uh, negatively impacting my immune functioning. So be cautious. It may, for some of you, this may not ring true, but for a lot of performers, particularly young performers, this can be a very significant issue that I face, if not daily, on a weekly basis with, um, with young performers. So be cautious. So the advice in this context is to eat lots of nutritious calories uh, from beneficial sources. Uh, and as you can see there on the left, the Eat Well Guide from the NHS, about a third of your diet, fresh fruits and vegetables, all the colors of the rainbow, about a third of the diet, complex carbohydrates, you know, whole grains, uh, potatoes, sweet potatoes, oats, and so forth. And the other about third sources of protein, um, fish, lean meat, chicken, uh, beans, legumes, uh, dairy and dairy alternatives, and so forth. If you eat this way, uh, this will lead you to optimal health, immune health. Thirdly, minimize intake of processed foods. What you don't consume is as important as what you do consume. And this is for three main reasons. Firstly, processed foods, by definition, are less nutrient dense. So they tend to replace the more nutrient dense calories in one's diet. So if you eat the hot dog, you won't eat the vegetables. If you eat the pizza, you won't eat the uh, oatmeal and so forth. So it tends to take away from that point one Secondly, the additives and refined sugars that tend to be associated with this type of foods um, are associated with decreases in immune functioning at a chronic level. We don't exactly know uh, the mechanism for this. We don't know the mechanism exactly, but it seems to have something to do with chronic levels of inflammation 
in the body that are exacerbated by high consumption of these types of foods, processed foods. And then thirdly, the conditions of overweight and obesity, which are often exacerbated by consumption of these foods, are associated with decreased immune functioning. So three reasons why processed foods are suboptimal for immune health. I would stress, however, in this context, don't let the, per uh, don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. Um, and very valuable advice I found over the years has been to follow the 80-20 rule. If you're doing the quote unquote right thing about 80% of the time, you can kind of do what you want for the other 20 and still gain the majority, if not all, the benefit of a healthy diet and lifestyle. So, you know, you don't have to remove entirely those foods you love, donuts, milkshakes, whatever. For me, it's pizza. You know, if you do the right thing 80% of the time, 20%, enjoy yourself. Enjoy all those foods that you love that might be culturally significant to you and so forth. Fourth, prioritize sleep. Uh, and there are some very, very valuable nutritional interventions that can help this. Um, now, this is another area like reflux, where there's a sort of ton of advice, a ton of advice you might have to wade through to get something valuable. But these are the ones I've, I've found to be the most important, the most valuable. Firstly, monitor caffeine intake. Unfortunately, it's very unfair, but caffeine has a very uh, variable half-life inter individual. So for some people, uh, you drink a cup of coffee and all of that caffeine will be out of your system in four or five hours. For some people, the half-life of caffeine can be 11, 12, 13, 14 hours. So that cup of coffee that you have at midday might still be impacting your ability, particularly to fall asleep, sleep latency at midnight. So if you are someone who has problems with your sleep, particularly sleep latency, falling asleep, I would invite you to consider bringing your last caffeine serving of the day earlier in the day and see if it helps. You might be one of those unfortunate, lucky, unlucky people who is genetically predisposed to have a, um, uh, to take a long time to eliminate caffeine from your system. So give that a go. The second is to keep consistent dietary habits. Very, very important for performing singers, you know, particularly those who have to eat late night and, and so forth. If you're used to having dinner at 7.30 p.m., having dinner suddenly one day at 10 p.m. will likely impact your sleep quality. So uh, something I often recommend for performers going from the rehearsal period, working in the daytime, to the performance period, working in nighttime, is to transition their eating habits to match the performance time. This will likely mean an improvement in sleep quality. Very important, particularly for musical theater performers who are performing six, seven, eight times a week for whom sleep is really, really important. The third is to consume adequate protein, especially tryptophan containing foods, things like milk, turkey, cheese, eggs, pumpkin seeds, Tryptophan is an amino acid precursor to the hormones serotonin, the sort of relaxing hormone, and melatonin, the sleep hormone. And if you have insufficient tryptophan in your system, your body might be less likely to shuttle what tryptophan you do have into the purposes of creating serotonin and melatonin, which will likely impact your sleep quality. So something else to consider for those uh, who might want to improve their sleep. And then finally, consuming adequate carbohydrate, um, which is often why people who adopt a low carbohydrate or ketogenic zero carbohydrate style diet will often complain about inability to fall asleep or inability to sleep well throughout the night. Quick science lesson, I'll try not to bore all of you, but the hormones insulin and cortisol are inversely related. So if insulin goes up, cortisol goes down. 
Cortisol is the stress hormone. So the higher levels of cortisol in your body, the more likely you are to feel stressed. When we eat high carbohydrate foods, our insulin levels rise. Conversely, our cortisol levels drop. This is why people binge eat high carbohydrate sugary foods when they are stressed. When was the last time you heard someone say, oh, I was so stressed last night, all I could eat was boiled eggs and broccoli? No, of course not. People eat, they say, I was so stressed last night, all I could eat was potato crisps, popcorn, ice cream, chocolate, high carbohydrate foods. Why? Even, you know, they haven't been bored by my quick science lesson. They know inherently that if they eat carbohydrate, the insulin will rise and the cortisol will drop. Now, I'm not saying eat a big ton of Ben and Jerry's before going to bed to, to manipulate this. However, eating a moderate amount of carbohydrate in the evening meal, dinner, is often what it's called, um, will help um, instigate a rise in insulin and a potential lowering of cortisol. You'll feel less stressed, more likely to sleep well. Quite a lot in there, guys, um, which a lot of people have further questions on, questions on, on this particular issue because I think poor quality sleep is a bit of a, a chronic issue in our society at the moment. I do have an article on this on my website, duncanrocknutrition.com, which outlines, uh, it links to all the research and, and outlines in more detail some of these interventions for those of you who might be interested. Just go to the website, it'll be under advice, very clear. Finally, keep exercising, but not too much. Um, obviously there are a slew of benefits attached to regular exercise improved cardiovascular health, muscular strength, bone density, metabolic profile, hormonal profile, and increased immune health. However, overtraining where your output exceeds your ability to recover can lead to very severe and acute decreases in immune functioning. This is why often boxers or fighters of, of some kind will often get glandular fever uh, in training camp, because they're so they're training so hard, even at their extreme level of fitness, they simply can't recover from that workload. Their immune system plummets, and they pick up some very obvious uh, illness of of poor immune function. So uh, this is this is known quite conclusively. Uh, this issue. So similar to point two, the, the eating sufficient calories, you don't need to give up on your fitness and health and, and body composition goals or athletic goals. But my advice would be to monitor your exercise intensity, how hard are you going, and your exercise duration or volume, how much running are you doing? So how fast are you running and how far are you running? Or intensity, how much, how heavy are the weights you're lifting, for example, and for how many repetitions, the volume. You need to monitor these two factors, and you don't want to exceed the point where you can no longer recover from your output. So unfortunately, this, this is an entire lecture series in itself, which I've given on exercise, particularly exercise for singers. Um, but just to give you some take home advice here, you never wanna go past about 80% of your maximum intensity when exercising. All the research tells us that if you go above that sort of eight out of 10, you might get slightly more health benefit, but your risk of overtraining, injury, fatigue, so forth, uh, hormonal disruption goes through the roof. If you keep it at about 80%, 60 to 80%, you'll get the majority of the health benefits, minimizing all of those risks associated with exercise. And Something I often like to suggest to people, never be sore from workouts. I'm working with a couple of the members of the new cast of Hamilton at the moment, when it, obviously when it reopens and just hugely athletic show, you know, it's long and they're dancing and singing and uh, a lot of them are working out really, really hard in preparation, um, which is great and admirable, but of course, they're at very high risk of overtraining. Um, and I tell them they should never be sore 
from their workouts. If you are, you know, you went and did a bunch of squats in the gym or went on a big run, if you're really sore the next day, that sort of achy, like, oh, I don't want to walk down a flight of stairs kind of sore, you probably went a little bit unnecessarily hard and back off a bit next time. Get your fitness level up through consistency. Consist don't, you know, consistency of effort, not intensity of effort. I realize a, a lot of you may have questions on this issue. It, it's normally what dominates um, the question and answer sections whenever I give lectures of this kind. I, I just worked for three weeks with the young artists in the San Francisco Opera. And this was the issue that they uh, most want to talk about. This was the area that they most had questions on. And in response to this, I've created a new ebook, um, which is a, a, a complete manual of exercise for professional voice users. And I, I'm sorry for the plug, but I think many of you might find this valuable. Um, you know, if you're unsure of how to exercise as a singer, if you think things like running or lifting weights may affect your voice, uh, what exercises you can, do, you can do to improve your singing posture, how intensely should you be training, should you train your abs, a very controversial issue with a lot of singing teachers. Um, this ebook that I've created in con conjunction with a colleague of mine is uh, the, uh, through the Voice Care Center is, is a complete safe and effective workout routine with the unique needs of voice professionals in mind. And there are some significant ones that professional voice users and singers should be aware of. And there's about 40 plus pages of exercise information, very detailed, all referenced to the relevant scientific literature and 30 plus video demonstrations of um, exercise technique and guidance, what to do, what not to do and so forth. And for those of you who may find this valuable, uh, we normally sell it through my website, duncanrockmutrition.com for 39 pounds. But if you get in touch and use the code SINGSPACE, you can get it for 29. Apologies for the plug, but people normally uh, are quite interested in it. So, and, I, and to be honest, I'm, I'm very proud of this document. It was some years in the making and I'm, I'm very glad to be uh, offering it to people now. Advertisement over. Point six. I sort of lied when I said there's five points, but I've been giving this lecture for some time now and I'm on the precipice of adding a final point. The consumption of pre and probiotic foods. Probiotics um, are the friendly bacteria in the gut and prebiotics feed the friendly bacteria in the guts, in the gut. The more we study this stuff, the more we realize how essential they are for optimal immune health and overall physiological health. These should be consumed on a daily basis um, for those of us who want to optimize our health. So things like yogurt, Greek yogurt, kefir, some types of cheeses, tempeh, kim kimchi, miso, all sorts of things. And then of course, feed them with the prebiotics, um, essential for, for digestive and immune health. Guys, just to finish quickly before I uh, open to some questions, I think we might have some already in the chat. Oh, sorry. Common myths and half-truths in the world of vocal health. Now these can be ubiquitous. Um, unfortunately, they can be based on very, we've already sort of alluded to some of them, but they can be based on very little or no evidence or even sometimes contrary to the evidence, which is in my experience very frustrating. This is the meanest I'll be today, but they are often perpetuated by anecdote, and I'm gonna say laziness. It's very easy for us to sort of parrot something that we maybe remember hearing a few months ago or 10 years ago from our first singing teacher and offer it as advice. It's much more difficult to look it up and see, hey, that thing I think I remember hearing four years ago, is that actually true? This is how misinformation gets spread in the culture and in this sphere, it is very easy and ubiquitous because some of these things can be very deep seated and hard to let go of. And I've experienced this. I've had clients almost get angry at me when I tell them that mega dosing on vitamin C might not be the best thing for their immune 
health. It, these things can be very, very deep seated in people so, and, and hard to let go of. So I understand uh, when these things are challenged, it can be a little bit, take some time to, uh, to release some of these half truths and myths, but they are unhelpful for two main reasons. The first we've already articulated, chasing the wrong solution, the wasted time and energy uh, of, you know, for example, in the current culture, a lot of people think they're gluten intolerant. That's because it's very popular at the moment to be gluten intolerant. People write articles about it, celebrities offer dietary advice about it, but rates of gluten intolerance don't suddenly shoot up because, I don't know, Oprah Winfrey has a guest on her show or whatever that talks about it. If you decide that you're gluten intolerant and that is the cause of your problems, you can, but it in fact isn't the cause of your problems. That can be a lot of wasted time, money, and energy chasing the wrong solution. But then secondly, and I think maybe more importantly and something very near and dear to my heart, unnecessary stress and neurosis. Singers have to contend with immune health, colds and flus, allergies, jet lag, excessive travel, now coronavirus, you know, do singers and voice performers really need more reasons to be neurotic? I would say no. So I offer this information so you can free yourself from the shackles of some of these really unhelpful myths. And I see so many singers tie themselves in a ball about the wrong things. So hopefully this advice will be helpful to you. It all comes from a pill and toxin bias that we have in our nutritional culture at the moment. It means this bias leaves people searching for that magical ingredient that they either need to consume or eliminate. Is it echinacea? Is it vitamin C? Is it wheatgrass? Is it acai berries? Or that magical toxin that they need to eliminate? Is it gluten? Is it dairy? Is it trans fats? The truth is, in general, eating patterns lead to benefit or detriment. And the additional subtraction of a single element rarely leads to significant change unless you're allergic to it. Now, this is understandable. We want this to be true. I would love to be able to tell you, if you take this pill, it'll fix all your problems. Or if you stop eating X, it'll fix all your problems. But the truth is, you know, of course we want that to be true, it's understandable, but the truth is if we want, uh, if that worked, we would have all fixed our problems by now. Eating patterns are what for most of us lead to benefit or detriment. And I'm just gonna finish by articulating this point with three really common examples of two toxins, caffeine and dairy, and one pill, that these things that come up over and over again in my work. So caffeine. Firstly, caffeine will not dehydrate you. All fluids except alcohol count to your daily fluid consumption. So even if caffeine may have a slight diuretic effect, diuretic means it increases the volume of your urine, it will be unlikely in excess of the extra fluid consumed in consuming that caffeine. So if you have a just to pull some numbers out of the air, 200 mil Americano, and it has a diuretic effect on you. It may not, but it might, of increasing your urine volume by 30 mils, you're still at a net gain of 170 mils of fluid. So that caffeine consumption, the cons uh, consumption of the caffeine containing drink still actually hydrated you. So I, I realize that if you Google what foods should singers avoid or you know top 10 google it right now you'll know what i'm talking about caffeine is at the top of every list it's a myth it's unhelpful don't be fooled by top 10 lists this is a a myth i wish would would just disappear um, uh, it's i don't know i don't know how it became so prominent there is also no strong evidence of impact on the voice specifically and there have been several studies that have tested even very high levels of caffeine on vocal health. You know, we're talking about people who drink six to 10 cups of coffee daily. You know, someone who you describe as a 
complete caffeine nut, caffeine addict. This has been shown to have little to no effect on markers of vocal health. There are some times where you might want to avoid caffeine. We've already touched on one, sleep latency and quality because of that variable half life of caffeine. The second and, and important one performance is anxiety and nerves. Obviously caffeine is a central nervous system stimulant. And you know, to use an example for myself, if I'm you know, going for a big audition or a big opening night, I'm already bouncing off the walls with like nervous energy and excitement. And I don't really need that extra stimulation that a cup of coffee might provide. However, if I'm on show, you know, 18 of a 30 show run on a Wednesday afternoon, well, it, under those circumstances, maybe I'm not feeling it so much. And a cup of coffee might be just what I need to get me into that slightly heightened performance zone. So, in, you know, this is a case of sort of knowing yourself in this context. So those are the areas where one might want to avoid caffeine, but not because, because it's going to dehydrate you. Dairy. Um, dairy does not create mucus in the vocal cords. Um, another myth that just has no uh, evidentiary basis. Um, Milk is an emulsion, which is droplets of fat suspended in liquid. Um, and emulsions have a certain viscosity, thickness, stickiness. That may be an issue in some people in a transient way. So some people do drink milk, for example, and sort of will express a sort of feeling of thickness in the throat, frogginess, stickiness, whatever. People just use it, describe it in different terms. This is because of the transient effect of some of the emulsion sort of leaving a residue in the throat, which of course will go away with a glass of water or just some time, saliva. But yeah, sure, something to be concerned, to be wary of as a performer. However, it's really important to note that this also occurs with other fluids. For example, soy milk. And in fact, there was one study, Australian study, that tested these reported sensations of thickness, stickiness between dairy, uh, you know, cow's milk and soy milk. And they found the reported sensations were consistent with whether the subject consumed a soy-based drink or a dairy-based drink. So if you're um, opting for a soy latte, for example, because you have to sing today, that's absolutely fine. I'm not, you know, trying to sell you anything. I'm not trying to sell you a cow. But just know that there's no evidence that that change from dairy to soy is having any meaningful substantive effect on those sensations in your throat. And any benefit you're likely experiencing, you're experiencing is likely psychosomatic. Lactose intolerance might be an issue. This is the inability to digest the sugars in milk. It, it differs very greatly depending on your genetic her heritage, your population genetics. Um, however, the symptoms of lactose intolerance relate to digestive issues, bloating, wind, upset stomach, and so forth. And, you know, these are not to be ignored, but they're not particularly vocally specific and don't represent the reasons that I normally come across that singers tend to avoid dairy. So for what it's worth, if you enjoy dairy, it, no evidence that it really should be an issue. And just quickly, because I've gone very a little bit over, vitamin C, we've already talked about. There is no substantive benefit to mega dosing and the, the focusing on the wrong thing element is crucial here. A pill is never a substitute for general healthy habits. And it can be very valuable to unplug that quite prominent mentality we have in our culture uh, right now from the pill and toxin bias. Guys, sorry, I went a little bit longer than I anticipated. Thank you so much for listening. Um, if I'm going to stop sharing, how do I do that? I press this button. And if anyone has any questions, I would love um, to answer them. I Duncan, 
first, thank you so much. Um, your chat is actually chocker full of questions, so I don't know whether you want to scan through. Um, and I mean, I say chocker, um, but there are some great questions that people have put in. Um, Let's I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm fumbling around over here. I just realised my computer's about to die. Well, so. I um, um, I'm not. So the first question was actually about a nebulizer, which I, I'm not sure whether it's your territory or not. Do you have any views on nebulizing, or should we refer that one to Stephen? Um, I, I have a rule where I never overstep my mandate. That would be a Stephen question. Sorry, I don't pretend to know things. Um, Steve, let's tag Steve. Stupid. Sorry, whoever asked that. Um, who wrote that? No, that's, that's okay. Um, so Sorry, I, Sheena. Sheena, we can let's tag um, Mr. Stephen King in a in a question um, uh, and ask that question. I think nebulizing is a great topic to have, so we'll bring that up tomorrow. Um, do you have any opinions on the keto diet and intermittent fasting from Hannah? Yes, Hannah. Um, who is Hannah? Uh, hello. Myself. Oh, hello, Hannah. Um, yeah, I, I um, let, let's 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 take them in order. So keto diet, um, yes, it can have, um, it can be very motivating because it tends to yield very quick results, particularly for people wanting weight loss. Um, I have two. So yes, I, I, I in fact, I, a client uh, I just saw before this uh, is is on a ketogenic diet that I recommended to her. I have a couple of issues. The first is the most important, which there's not a huge amount of evidence for long-term efficacy. So long-term health outcomes. When I say that, I mean five to 10 years plus. It can be very good in the short term um, to yield quick results. So what I would normally suggest is to try it for about six to 12 months and then to start introducing carbohydrate-based foods. This is mainly because of um, fiber content. It's very hard to get sufficient fiber in a ketogenic diet. Um, and the more we research fiber, the more we realize it's associated with um, positive health, health outcomes um, in the long term. Um, and then also, uh, this isn't important for some people, but culturally, it can be a little bit difficult to follow a ketogenic diet. You know. Um, so many of the foods we eat socially, um, but, you know, my mom's from Brazil and all Brazilian cuisine is like carb carbohydrates everywhere, you know, pão de queijo and lasagnas and, and all this kind of, it, it, it can leave you a bit out in the cold uh, at family events, you know, uh, and so, you know, that, that can be a major drawback for some people. Um, I've done it myself for six weeks and like I've seen the effect of it and I've, I've, it, the intention was to, to lose weight um, and that has happened, which is good. But I'm also a bit worried now that when I stop, <laughs> um, it is just going to rock it back up to. Yeah, it, if, without, uh, obviously I, it's hard to give specific advice because I, I don't know you, but um, generally uh, I would reintroduce carbohydrates slowly, um, maybe one meal a day. Um, a lot of people like to start by introducing fruit. That's another reason I'm not such a fan of keto because it, it will vilify something like fruit, which is generally very healthy. Um, so yeah, maybe add some fruits to your diet, then maybe some, you know, complex carbohydrates, brown rice, the oats, things like that. Um, I'm, not a, I'm not against a lower carbohydrate diet. I think this can be very valuable for a lot of people. Um, but keto, in my experience can be unnecessarily extreme in the long term. Okay. Is that a, is that answer? Oh yes, and fasting. Yeah, fasting's great, uh, actually. Um, I would recommend more of a, uh, if I say 16, eight, um, where, where one fasts in a sort of daily, hourly sense, rather than, you know, when people start to try and do like 24 hour fasts, 48 hour fasts, it can start to look a bit like disordered eating, if I'm honest, um, which is obviously we want to avoid. Um, whereas, you know, the, the truth is eating three meals a day is arbitrary. There's no physiological reason we do this. We do it culturally. Um, I, I do intermittent fasting myself and it's, it's, um, 
you know, I'm, I'm 37 in two days and I'm in the sort of best shape of my life um, from, from, uh, from doing it. So uh, sorry to go into more detail will probably take way too long. Does, is that helpful? Oh, awesome. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. <laughs> oh, thanks. Yeah. Um, I think we missed one just, just really quick. Uh, oh, also from Hannah and Nia. Yeah. Uh, sorry. I, I, I think I gave you a slight bum steer. So in terms of weight loss, yeah, 0.5 to 1% of total body weight would be the maximum you'd want to lose. So if, if you weigh 50 kilos, you would want to lose between about 250 to 500 grams a, a, a week would be the max, absolute max. Sorry, to, sorry for the confusion. Any, what else do we have? Oh, yeah. vegan diet from Zoom. Oh, Zoom user, how uh, enigmatic. Um, it's, uh, look, the vegan diet is really fantastic, actually, um, particularly in terms of uh, long-term health outcomes. Uh, long, we're talking about longevity here, you know, in 60s, 70s, 80s. If, if, if you want guidance, the issue I come up against a lot is there's a cultural assumption that the vegan diet is by default very healthy, which is not the case. You know, a lecturer of mine would often remind us, you know, Oreos are vegan too, you know, and obviously, you know, if you ate all Oreos, you know, and some of the research that, um, proliferated this current sort of boom in veganism from a nutritional perspective was very subject, we know now, was very subject to what we call healthy user bias. And so studies were done that showed vegans had, you know, improved rates of cardiovascular health and muscular strength and endurance and so forth. But what they didn't recognize at the time was that healthy behaviors tend to come in groups. So people who are vegan also tend not to drink, also tended not to smoke, also tended to be, you know, exercise a lot. You know, in my experience, vegans are very conscientious people um, and, and often very health conscious. Now that culturally veganism is becoming more of a thing, we're now seeing that you can have healthy vegans and you can have unhealthy vegans, um, depending on what you eat. So a curated vegan diet is extremely healthy, but from a a purely nutritional perspective, not talking about obviously the ethical and environmental concerns, which are very important. Um, we know now that a plant-based diet that contains some animal products tends to be superior for most people. That if I give an advice, if I give a lecture on just general healthy eating, just to put it into a sentence, I would say eat whole foods, so foods as close to their original state as possible mostly plants, so plant-based, not too much. Eat whole foods, mostly plants, not too much. If you follow this general principle, that's a healthy diet. Sorry, that was a really long answer to a quite short <laughs> question. Anyone else? Oh, there's more here. What was the name of the book? Sorry, which book? My, my ebook? Oh, it, it's, um, it's called Oh, now I've forgotten the name of my own book. It's a um, exercise prof for professional voice users. If you're interested, oh, sorry, I've lost my screen. Sorry, guys. Duncan, I will link to your book and your website. Um, I've put it in the chat now. Um, I've linked to Duncan's website. Can you see in the comments anyone who wants to go there? And I'm going to link to the book now. Um, and I, we can also... We'll do it. I'll do a post tomorrow um, and link to it there as well. Yes, Kat did ask about adrenal fatigue above, which was a great question. Yeah, oh, sorry. I, I seem to have lost the visual on my screen, but I can hear. So I'm just going to keep talking. I, I don't I'll, know what... read, I'll read them out, except I've got 4% battery. So oh, gosh. <laughs> this is going to be um, great. Yeah, this is going to go great. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Look, adrenal fatigue, the best advice, uh, unfortunately, like I said, I don't want to overstep my mandate, uh, tends to be medical. Um, 
Oh, here we go. Now I'm back. Ah, here we go. Sorry about that. Um, caffeine consumption can, can exacerbate adrenal fatigue and of course, lack of sleep. So all the things we talked about in that sleep section would be really valuable to you. Um, and, and I'll plug again, there's a free article on my website, which outlines in detail those things we talked about. Um, but in terms of just general eating, unfortunately, there's not a huge amount one can do for fatigue, adrenal fatigue, apart from just general healthy eating habits. Sorry to not be able to give you more there. Does anyone else have any questions before we finish off? Yes, a gentleman in blue, Alberto. Hi, uh, everyone. Yeah, my question is about uh, uh, exercising, uh, getting in the gym and that kind of uh, things. Um, do you have any uh, other book recommendations or uh, um, I noticed uh, um, there is their impact a lot in my, my, my voice when I do uh, exercise, when I get in the gym and, and do so much and always had problems and my students too, problems with uh, the amount of exercise they do and I, I do and I cannot uh, fix it. Uh, uh, I'm I'm looking for for yeah for advice uh, between how how much exercise how how little yeah yeah and I will buy your book certainly but uh, yeah do you have any idea? Yeah, I mean obviously the greatest book ever written on the topic is called Exercise for Singers by Duncan Rock and uh, no okay no. It, you know, Albert, it's, it's a really great question and, and, and often asked because because there's a lot of um, misinformation in the sphere. Um, it, sorry, I'm not not to make a joke. We I do, I do answer these questions in the ebook. And to be honest, if, if if you do get it and, and still have more questions, you can always email me and I'll, I'll give you more information. But there's a wonderful book which I would recommend to you um, called it's got a silly title, but it is absolutely brilliant. It's called Becoming a Supple Leopard. You'll never forget the name. And it's by an American doctor of physiotherapy, a physical therapist called Dr. Kelly Starrett. Um, and he's a gentleman who works with uh, professional athletes and CrossFit athletes, and Olympic athletes, uh, American football players and so forth. And he has really synthesized a, a Bible of human movement. It's a big old, I don't have it here, it's downstairs, but that talks about all the commonly experienced physiological issues that tend to accompany strenuous exercise, knee problems, ankle problems, shoulder problems, lower back pain, tension in the neck and traps and so forth, and details multiple fixes for them through exercises, stretches, foam rolling techniques, um, lacrosse ball techniques and so forth. Um, uh, one might say it's even better. <laughs> it's even better than my book, but obviously not um, not singer specific. Uh, so, it, but yes, a lot of what I know uh, has has come from the work he's done and, and sort of peripheral work around around that. Do you want me to write that down in the thing here? Becoming a supple leopard. There you go. Uh, I'm sure it's the only book available with that title, you won't get confused. Does that help, Alberto? Yeah, thank you so much. My pleasure, my pleasure. Anybody else? Did I miss anything? I am, um, I put honey lemon ginger question mark. Um, I, I like it and it uh, may, is it a myth or does it have a value? Look, it, it has a value if you like it. Right, it's, it's yeah. tastes nice. I, I like honey and lemon tea, and yeah, actually, it, it there is some evidence it can have a what we call a demulcent effect, like a irritation reducing effect on on the vocal mechanism. Um, in terms of like soothing or and things like that, no. Um, but you know, it's hydrating and particularly if you have it hot, you get that external hydration and internal hydration from consuming it. So 
it, it's look it's it's not going to fix all the world's problems but enjoy enjoy anybody else oh did, what i don't know what that sound means is that someone leaving? No, I think that was just my WhatsApp messages going on. I, I just unmuted to say thank you, and then I think I got a message. Um, that was brilliant, and I was just looking at your website, and there's everybody, you know, there's heaps of articles on Duncan's website. So if you go to, I think it's Duncan Rock Nutrition. Um, go on, dot com. Dot com. Uh, there's lots of great stuff on there, so um, dip in and enjoy. Thank you, Duncan. That was really interesting. Guys, thank you so thanks so much for coming and thanks for listening and for your great questions. Um, yeah, it's a pleasure. I wish you all the best in your careers and your teaching careers and hopefully see you soon. Thanks, Duncan. Too Bye, easy. everyone. See you, at, see you in the morning with a straw. S O V T Wednesday morning. Bye everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye.